During the past two weeks, I have spent my time away visiting family in Egypt. During my time in Egypt, I was lucky enough to visit various sites, one of which was the Great Pyramids of Giza. In today's video, I'll go into detail on some of the accepted theories of the construction of these wonderful monuments, and also some of my thoughts when visiting them. There are three pyramids that are largely intact and impressive. Khufu, the most impressive, originally standing at 481 feet. Khafre, slightly smaller than Khufu, at 171 feet. Amankuri, the smallest pyramid, standing at 213 feet which also has a visible gash down the side of it from the son of Saladin, who set out to tear down the pyramid. These pyramids are one of the seven wonders of the world, and for good reason. They baffle scientists on how they were constructed at such an early date for human civilization, when we only had very primitive technology. As I approach the pyramids, I'm amazed by the enormous size of them. They tower over what is now New Cairo, with a compact population living in tall apartment buildings, showing a dominance that is still apparent from the ancient Egyptian times. The pyramids are an extraordinarily old monument, with Khufu's being built in 2570 BC, Khafre's in 2540 BC, and Menkuri's in 2490 BC. They are so old that in fact the famous pharaoh Cleopatra was actually born closer to the release of the first iPhone than to the construction of the Great Pyramids. This highlights the gigantic scale of time that ancient Egypt had endured. The Great Pyramid, Khufu's, consists of an estimated 2.3 million blocks, approximately 5.5 million tonnes of limestone, 8,000 tonnes of granite and 500,000 tonnes of mortar were used in the construction weighing on average 2.5 tonnes per block. The ramp theory is one of the most accepted theories and has a lot of evidence to back it up. It discusses that the pyramids were made with sheer manpower, tens of thousands of workers, not slaves. Stones were supposedly pulled across the desert with ropes and sled, using wet sand to reduce friction. The wet sand made the stones a lot easier to drag, and this practice can actually be seen in some ancient wall paintings. Once the stones were dragged across the desert, it's believed that one of a series of ramp options were erected to drag the stones to the top as they built upwards. With sand, workers created either a straight ramp up one side, a spiraling ramp that wrapped around the pyramid, or a combination of the two. Levers were also supposedly used once a significant height was reached and ramps were no longer feasible. This theory is supported by the fact that sleds are well documented in ancient wall paintings, as are images of giant statues being pulled by hundreds of men. These ramps would have been very time consuming to construct. I'll leave a link to a video that goes into a little more detail here. The water shaft theory differs from the ramp theory at most points, starting with how the stones were transported. While the ramp theory discusses dragon stones across the desert, this theory outlines that special canals were constructed all the way to the build sites, allowing the stones to float all the way there. Floats were supposedly made of wood, or inflated animal skins wrapped in papyrus and when attached to the stones, they would allow them to pull them up from the shore. The canals lead to a moat that went all the way around the build site's perimeter, allowing the blocks to be floated to the side where they were needed most. Four water pipelines were then supposedly used to float the blocks uphill and were extended as the pyramid grew. A series of gates controlled how the blocks moved upwards from the moat to the top. In this theory, these canals and water elevators allowed the stones to be moved pretty easily. Although there is no concrete documented evidence of this theory, traces of water throughout the structure and imperfections along the middle of the four sides have been identified to support the water shaft theory. To me, this theory is too complex. I feel like the water system is almost as complex as the actual construction of the pyramids, but that's just my opinion. Again, I'll leave an in-depth video here so you can make up your own mind. In recent times, one man stands apart from all the others who have attempted to solve the mystery of how the pyramids were built. He is a French architect named Jean-Pierre Houdin. 
Since the 1990s, he has devoted all his time to studying the Great Pyramids, and has been able to design the most brilliant pyramid construction theory ever conceived. According to Houdin, the Great Pyramid was constructed with the use of two separate spiral ramps. The first one was the outer spiral ramp, ascending about 30% the way up, and the second one was the internal spiral ramp, through which the heavy stones would drag the rest of the way to the top. Houdin calculated that this internal ramp had a slope of 7 degrees. This spiral ramp also included open sections on the corners for the workers to turn the blocks. This is where it is thought that the cranes were used. In addition to the internal ramp, Houdin has also been able to explain how the King's Chamber was built, as well as the most mysterious room within the Great Pyramid, the Grand's Gallery. The massive granite blocks above the King's Chamber were pulled up through the Grand Gallery with a long pulley system, meaning that the Grand Gallery exists for a practical purpose. Inside are signs that support this theory, such as holes that have been wedged into the rocks, they are believed to have been used to support the pulley system. Houdin's theory has a lot going for it. Using digital technology, a team of computer programmers was able to test the idea. They have been able to confirm that Houdin's blueprints for the pyramid measure up mathematically and that the internal ramp is plausible. Most astonishingly, however, is that they were able to find evidence for the actual existence of a ramp using a low density scan of the pyramid, which revealed a spiral shaped image. This could very well be the remains of the internal ramp. By far, this theory gives us the most plausible explanation for how the pyramids were built. I'll link a 3D animated video detailing just how the pyramids were built according to this theory. These are just three of the many theories people have come up with to explain the construction of the pyramids. I can understand why people are drawn to more extreme theories, such as extraterrestrials or long lost civilizations, but I do believe that extraordinary claims need to be backed with extraordinary evidence or at least a little bit of concrete evidence, not evidence that can be open to interpretation. The pyramids now, a dusty, old and scarred monument, used to stand taller, layered with a white, glimmering limestone that was so polished it would reflect the rays of the sun. It is believed that the original pyramid, with its casing stones, would act like a gigantic mirror and reflect light so powerful that it would be visible from the moon. Now moving into the pyramid. After the Great Pyramid was initially sealed, its original entrance was hidden and faced with smooth limestone. Because this blended in so well with the surrounding casing, the opening was invisible. Around 820 AD, Abdullah al Mamun mobilised his men to bore a tunnel into the pyramid to search for chambers and treasure. Due to the difficulty of the task, fire was built to heat up the rock and then cold vinegar poured over it. Battering rams were used to pound away the weakened rock and clear a tunnel. Eventually a passageway was found which descended into the lowest chamber of the pyramid. Up to the tomb is a long narrow incline where you have to crouch to walk through. As we ascend, the air begins to become thin. I don't know if it was because there was less oxygen or simply because it was just so hot and humid that it felt difficult to breathe. After the initial low down passage, you arrive at the Grand Gallery, which is a chamber that is believed to have been used to pull up blocks using a rolling system, although this isn't quite yet confirmed. Climbing up the gallery and reaching the top, I met with another tunnel that leads into the King's Chamber. Crawling through and reaching the other side, I stand in shock. I'm inside the pyramids, the stones surrounding me weighing 25 to 80 tons, and giant granite beams almost hovering above me. The beams are 2 meters thick and 8 meters long and they've been elevated roughly 20 feet into the air and placed gently and precisely on the roof of the King's Chamber. Near the back wall is where the granite sarcophagus is located. The cover for the sarcophagus is missing, as is the King's mummy. Some have suggested that this sarcophagus is a substitute, hastily prepared when the original was damaged, but there's no evidence to support this and it doesn't explain why it's unfinished. It is by no means clear that the King's Chamber was actually intended for a burial, if it was, it was the first and only time that a burial chamber was placed above the entrance. I'm so grateful I was able to visit this incredible monument. It's hard to grasp just how advanced and amazing the ancient Egyptians were. From incredible architecture and mathematics to the invention of paper. Who knows what continues to lie beneath the sand of Egypt, a civilization filled with mystery and riches, the motherland of the human species. Thanks for watching today's video. There is still so much more about the pyramids that I haven't covered in this video, so as always, 
I encourage you to satisfy your curiosity and research into them further. I've left some links to my sources below, as well as the book I'm currently reading, The Rise and Fall of Ancient Egypt. If you like this video and want to see more, then please like and subscribe. It really does go a long way. Thank you.